Good morning. Good morning. We've got some visiting with us today. We want to welcome you to our services today. We're in a study of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. When you came to church today, I assume you came on some road. There's all kinds of roads in the world. I saw that there's over 4 million miles of roadway in the United States alone. Some are good roads, some are bad roads. Some drivers have more horsepower than they have poor sense. They make even good roads dangerous. But I want to talk today about a highway to heaven. And I hope you're on that highway. But if you're not, you can get on it today. And we encourage you to do so. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But it's amazing how many do not know the way. They may think they know the way. But uh, there's two ways that the Lord speaks of here. There's a broad way and there is a narrow way. We're going to read verses 13 and 14 in Matthew chapter 7, be our text today. Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, <clears throat> for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. So be sure you're on the right way. Too many people are on the wrong way. I heard about a guy named Douglas Corrigan back in 1938. He took off from New York to fly nonstop to California. He took off in his plane on a foggy morning. He flew into a haze and disappeared. About 28 hours later, he landed, not in California, but in Ireland. He instantly became a national hero because he had done something nobody thought could be done. But from that day on, he was known as Wrong Way Corrigan. <laughs> well, be sure you're not on the wrong way. Each person here is on one of these two roads that Jesus speaks of here. He speaks of a series of contrasts in the rest of his sermon. He talks about two gates, two trees, two houses. And tonight, today we're going to look at the two gates. One is narrow, the other is very broad. So if you want to take notes this morning, let's look at this. First of all, we see the division of all mankind. Jesus divides all of mankind in these two groups. Now, we like to divide people into different groups. We do that based on ethnicity or nationality or skin color, social standing, education. We've got all kinds of categories. But with Jesus, it's only two, the saved and the lost. Those who are on the narrow way, those who are on the broad way. And he says the broad way is where most people are traveling. Only a few take the narrow way to heaven. That brings us to the two groups. One is those who have rejected Christ. These are the ones that's on the broad way. They have yet to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, it's obvious that most people in the world today are lost. That's a sad fact, but it's a fact. According to the world population clock, the population of the world today stands close to 8 billion people. 8 billion people. And most of them are lost. Most of them do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you think about these people, they're not all alike. Uh, some are depraved people. 
There are depraved people on this broad way. They love sin. They eagerly follow the paths of sin. Paul spoke of them in Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3, that they walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's, that's the devil, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So there are people just depraved. They have rejected God, all the things of God. And it, you see that in our world today. I read that $10 billion is spent each year in America on pornography. $128 million spent on liquor. Our society is marked by indulgence, sensuality, immorality. That's the course of this world in which we live. I don't know the depraved people. There are decent people on this Broadway. People that you would uh, enjoy having as friends and neighbors. These are good, decent people. They live good, honest, moral lives. They're not given over to sinful living. They make good neighbors. They make good workers. But they're not saved. Yet they've yet to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Many of them, they're trusting in themselves. Now, if you ever get out and talk to people about their spiritual condition, you're asking them if they think that they would go to heaven if they should die today, most lost people would say, yes, I'd go to heaven. But it's based upon their good works, that I'm too good to go to hell. Folks, there's none too good to go to hell. There's none too bad that need to go to heaven. So there are those. There's a, th a third group I would call the deceived. There are those who are religious that are on this broad way. They are very religious. And again, because of believing in a false doctrine, they are lost. Later on, we're going to see in chapter 7, look at verse 21. So not everyone saith unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter to the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You say, well, what's the will of the Father? The trust in his Son. The will of the Father is trust in my Son, and you'll be saved. But it says many appear before Christ. They say, Lord, we've done all these wonderful things for you. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I think that's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Here are people, they've been deceived by false doctrine, by false religion. They think they're on their way to heaven, and they're going to end up in hell. That's sad. I read there's 19 major world religions, which are subdivided into a total of 270 large religious groups, and then there's many more smaller ones. 34,000 separate Christian groups have been identified in the world. Multitudes that are unsaved. Many have been deceived into believing a lie. So those are those who have rejected Christ or not at least received him yet. But then the ones on the narrow pathway are those who have received Christ. They're on the right the right way because they've entered that narrow gate by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when it says, few there be saved, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not many who are saved. One, one survey estimated 33% of the world population profess to be Christians. Christianity, in that broad sense, is the largest religious group in the world. Of course, this includes a lot of denominations, a lot of organizations and cults that are not truly Christian, not in the truest sense of the word. They do not trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior. They may believe in Jesus, but they want to add something else to it. 
But I'm sure that there are millions of born-again Christians in the world today. I believe when the rapture happens, when Christ comes to call his people home, that uh, there's going to be a lot of people that will be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. Only God knows how many are truly saved. But no doubt there are millions who have received Christ as Savior. I'm thankful I'm one of the few. I'm one of those few on the narrow way. And I hope you are too. There's a song I, we used to sing long ago. We don't sing it much anymore. But it describes one man's experience of salvation. It goes like this. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top, many things below. I went to the keeper and settled long ago. The old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said I would settle, and I settled long ago. Long ago, down on my knees, long ago, I settled it all. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Hallelujah. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. Hey, can you sing that song? Has the account been settled? When I confessed my sins as a nine-year-old boy, my old account, wasn't a very large account at nine years old, but it was settled. And I've been saved ever since. Amen. Amen. Second thing I want you to see is the decision of all mankind. We not only have two crowds, we have two courses. These words, enter ye, in verse 13, calls for a decision to be made on our part. Everyone has to choose which way he will go. The broad way is the easy way. If you want to follow the crowd, just get on the broad way, go with the flow. That's easy. It's when you're going against the flow it gets hard. So many people are comfortable on the broad way because they're just going with the flow. They're going with the crowd. There are no restrictions on this broad way. It's open to all the religions as well as to the non-religious. It's open to the moral as well as to the immoral. It's open to the defiled as well as to the decent. Whoever or whatever is welcomed on the broad way. There's no restrictions. Now, some think the broad way is a delightful way. And if you like sin, it would be, I guess. But you know, the Bible says, Proverbs 13, 15, the way of transgressors is hard. The way of transgressors is hard. It may seem easy for a while, but it ends in disaster. Those who sow to the wind, the Bible says, will reap the whirlwind. Second, there's no requirements to travel the broad way. The Bible says, Proverbs 14, 12, There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The ways of death. But this is open to everybody. No matter what you want to believe, no matter how you want to live, you're welcomed on the broad way. Matter of fact, all this is going to come to a head one day in a great world, one world religion, which will be under the Antichrist. That's what's coming. So the mantra for many of these people is, you go to your church, and I'll go to mine. But let's walk along together. That sounds great, doesn't it? That's the theme song. 
doesn't matter what church you go to, because we're all working to get to the same place. I'm not. I'm not working to get to heaven. Jesus did that for me. On the cross, he did the work of redemption. So I can't join in with a crowd that's trying to work their way to heaven. Salvation is based upon God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. But the narrow way is the eternal way. It's described as being straight and narrow. And it's not without restrictions or requirements. Being straight shows it's restrictive. Being narrow shows it does have some requirements. It's the eternal way because it's God's way. The way of eternal salvation. Now on the broad way, there are many different ideas and opinions. Some say that you have to join their church. In order to be saved, you have to follow their rules, their regulations. They got all these different things that they teach others to follow. But on the straight and narrow way, there's only one way. Folks, it's through Jesus Christ, trusting Him as your Lord and Savior. You can't add anything to that. It's not Jesus plus anything else. It's Jesus alone. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You think he really meant that? He said there's no other way. The Bible says in Acts 4, 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, Whereby we must be saved. No other name. Yet the world resists that. Matter of fact, people get mad when you say Jesus is the only way. They just can't believe that. Jesus called himself the door to heaven. John 10, 9. Those on the broad way want to add a lot of other things. They say repentance of sin and faith in Christ is just not enough. Not enough to get to heaven. Folks, the straight and narrow way is kind of like a turnstile. Only one person at a time can go through. You can't go in as a crowd. You've got to do this individually. You've got to make the choice yourself requires a personal decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You cannot go in holding on to somebody's coattail. Nobody can get saved for you. If I could, I'd get saved for you. Absolutely. I'd come down this aisle on my hands and knees to get saved for you. But I can't do it for you. Nobody else can do it for you. This is this decision you have to make. Now, folks, listen. Isn't Jesus being very honest and straightforward about this? He's not trying to hide anything from people. He's not trying to hide that there are difficulties in this life. It's not going to be an easy, cheap way to live. We have to understand from the outset that we cannot walk the narrow way with Jesus Unless we choose to turn from sin and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe to get through that narrow gate, you might have to unload some things. Leave some things behind. You've heard of the eye of the needle gate mentioned in the Bible. So I think that that was a gate where to get a camel who is burdened with a load... They would have to take that load off the camel, force the camel to its knees, and go through the gate that way. My idea is there's some things you've got to unload. Get on your knees humbly before God and trust in Him. 
So the Christian life can be difficult. It's not easy. The standards are high. The doctrine is narrow. Because of its difficulty, few want to enter in. They want to avoid anything that's hard and difficult. Is that way people are? People want to avoid these things. You know why only a few kids make the honor row at school? It's easier to make C's and D's than to make A's and B's. I think most kids could make A's and B's if they would apply themselves. But they don't want to apply themselves. They want to take the easy route. But here's a decision that faces every individual. Will you choose to stay on the Broadway? Or will you exit off and get on the narrow way? It is a call from God to make a personal decision. Folks, it comes down to this. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Because what you do with him now will determine what he's going to do with you later on. Most important decision you'll ever make. I heard about a couple. Prior to getting married, they agreed that he would make all the major decisions in the marriage and she would make all the minor ones after 20 years of marriage somebody asked him how that arrangement had worked out he said great and all these years I never had to make a major decision they've all been minor ones according to my wife well this is a major decision no one else can make it for you. Then thirdly, we see the destination of all mankind. There's two crowds, two choices, two consequences. How you decide what you do with Jesus, folks, it determines your eternal destiny. That's how important this is. Where are you going to spend eternity? The broad way leads to destruction. The narrow way leads to life eternal. The broad way leads to a ruined life. This is the highway to hell. And it leads to spiritual ruin. To be eternally separated from God. We read in Luke 16, 22 and 23 that the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. That's the destination of all who die without Christ. Yet most on the broad way believe, they don't even believe hell exists. They don't believe hell exists. They rejected much of what the Bible says. Now, you may be one of them. You may not believe there is a hell. But I guarantee you're going to change your mind about a second after you die. Like the rich man, you're going to lift your eyes up being in torment. I don't say that with any pleasure. I don't enjoy preaching about hell. Amen. I don't avoid it. But to think about people spending eternity in torment. And yet we all know people that are going that way. Somebody doesn't reach them. That's where they'll spend eternity. You find out personally just how real hell is. But let me remind you, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that it's not God's will that any should perish. It's that all come to repentance. And you think about all that God has done to 
keep you from going to hell. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, who willingly came and died a horrible death. He suffered hell for us. So we wouldn't have to go there. God gave us the Bible. God gave us the church. God gave us soul winners. All these things God is doing to keep people from dying and going to hell. Don't blame God if that's where you end up. It's not God's will that you should go there. As I said, a lot of people get uptight when you say there's only one way to heaven. You know, the Oprah Winfrey crowd. They really get uptight about that. She said, no, there's many roads to heaven. She said, there's not just one Christian road, there's many roads. They say it's like, well, like when we all came to church today, some of you came from the west, from Tulsa. Some of you came from the east, from Coweta. Maybe from the north or the south. Yet we all ended up in the same place. Right? And they think that's the way it is with heaven. There's many roads that go to heaven. We don't all have to be on the same road. Well, that may sound logical, but it's not what the Bible teaches. Again, Jesus said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. So many seem to want to design their own way to heaven. They think God will honor them because they're sincere. Sincerity is not enough. You know, the Pharisees were pretty sincere, weren't they? I think they were very sincere people. Very devout. And yet Jesus told them that the proselytes they make, they make twofold more the child of hell than themselves. So being religious, being sincere, is not going to get it. A broad way leads to a ruined life. The narrow way leads to a redeemed life. Now you can call me narrow-minded because I say there's only one way to heaven. But you know, you have to be narrow-minded to be on the narrow way. Does that make sense? You have to be narrow-minded to be on the narrow way. So that, there's nothing wrong with that. The narrow way is the one that leadeth unto life. What kind of life? Jesus said in John 3, 15, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the kind of life we're talking about. John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Folks, the broad way leads to hell. The narrow way leads to heaven. One leads to a ruined life, the other leads to a redeemed life. W.B. W. Henson, great preacher of a past generation, got the news from his doctor that he was going to die. He wrote this concerning that moment. I remember a year ago when the doctor told me I would soon die. I went home, looked up at the mountain and at the river, looked up at the stars. I said, mountain, I shall be alive when you're gone. River, I shall be alive when you cease running toward the sea. Stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen from your sockets in the great downpulling of the material universe. He has eternal life. Eternal life. The truth is, whether you're in heaven or in hell, you're going to exist forever. Those who die and go to hell are not going to cease to exist. Hell is forever. A place of eternal torment. While heaven is a place of eternal bliss. So again, folks, the decision that faces each one of us, 
Where do I plan to spend eternity? You've got to choose very carefully when it comes to your eternal destiny. Think about this. Jesus does not say, don't enter the Broadway. Don't enter the Broadway. He says it because you're already on the Broadway. If you're not saved, that's where you are. I guess you would enter the Broadway at the point, age of accountability, when you cease not to accept Christ as your Savior. When you go past that point, you've entered into the Broadway. But you can exit off that Broadway anytime. Just putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Heard about a nightclub called the Gates of Hell. Probably a good name for it. A visitor to town was looking for this place. He saw a cop and he asked him where this place was. So happened that this nightclub was on the same street as a church called Calvary. So the cop told the visitor, he said, well, if you go down this street past Calvary, you will enter the gates of hell. How true that is. Everyone that enters through the gates of hell will have to bypass Calvary. You must pass by the cross of Christ. How about it today? I hope God has spoken to some hearts today to warn you that this is something you cannot put off. It's so dangerous to delay making this decision. I heard about a stewardess announcing to the passengers she said, this is flight 23, heading for St. Louis. If St. Louis is not in your plans today, I suggest you deplane right now. Friend, if hell is not in your plans, I strongly suggest you get off that broad way today. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him. So again, we're facing these two gates. Most of you have already entered the straight and narrow way. There's a few of you here that have yet to accept Christ as your Savior. We pray for you. We pray for your salvation. We want you to know the peace that comes by knowing Christ as your Savior. Now think about that. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. Did I catch you by surprise? Let's do it again. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. That feels good, doesn't it? It feels good to know that you have a home in heaven. Now if you could not say amen because you're not sure of your salvation, I implore you, I exhort you, get on the right path today. You say, preacher, I'm not really sure what I need to do.